Interesting. Good evening, and thank you for being part of this virtual fireside chat. We have a really exciting program planned for you this evening. Uh, I'm David Sittenfeld, director of the Center for the Environment here at the museum. The Centers for Public Science Learning and the Boston Science Common, including the Center for the Environment that I lead, are the museum's strategic effort to address science at the rapid pace of change across all of our platforms, lever leveraging content and innovation from people like our guests this evening, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. This is a wonderful and fitting event to start what I think will be a very special year. 2024 here at the Museum of Science is going to be the year of the Earth shot. It will be a 12 month spotlight on climate change with a specific focus on solutions and active hope for a sustainable and vibrant world. When we started to think about this event and who our guests should be, I immediately recommended Fabian Cousteau, a world famous aquanaut, oceanographic explorer, environmental advocate, and founder of the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center and the Proteus Ocean Group. You will learn what all of those things are, I think, during tonight's conversation. And here at the museum, we were very fortunate to be outreach partners for what was called the Mission 31 campaign 10 years ago. You'll hear about that. And we were part of special programs and live remote chats with the aquanauts in their habitat. Uh, and it really made me realize this would be a wonderful way to kick off this event. Thank you so much for being here, Fabian. It's a real treat to have you, and I know you've already captivated the hearts and minds of some folks who got to interact with you today uh, in the museum. We're going to start tonight with some remarks from our president, Tim Ritchie, and then we'll dive into conversation with some prepared questions that I have for both of our, our speakers. And I'll also mix in questions that we'll be receiving um, from you remotely through Slido. You can use the link that uh, has been put in the chat, or you can go to slido.com uh, and type in MOS Fireside Chat, all one word. Uh, and I promise I'll get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have this evening. So I'd like to start by saying hello to our president, Tim Ritchie. Thanks for being here, Tim. Uh, as I just mentioned, part of the objective for the Center of uh, the Environment, Center for the Environment and the Year of Our Earthshot here at the museum is to accomplish a vision to educate on current science at the pace of change. What led you to this vision and why do you believe we need to put current science issues front and center for our audiences? Yeah, well, David, thanks. And thanks to the uh, everybody who's on the audience today. Thank you for everything you do for the museum. It's a real pleasure to be here at the Museum of Science. And when I think about the importance of science at the pace of change, I think <clears throat> about what it means to live on a planet with 8 billion people, with climate change, and with all the changes that are happening. And you realize that if we are gonna live sustainably and humanely on Earth, it will only be through the wise use of science and technology. That is our only hope to do so. And so we want to have people enthusiastic about current science and technology to help us live sustainably and humanely. And if you're not aware of it, if you can't see a place for yourself in it, you will be left behind. But worse than that, you will not be hopeful. And you used the word active hope just a minute ago. That, among other things, is what the Museum of Science has to bring to the world. That we as humans have the capacity to solve the problems we face in innovative ways. So we can be hopeful. But we also, there is a place for us in it, and that's part of our message. And that place will come through current science and technology. So science at the pace of change for everyone, for a world that needs us, is a place where the Museum of Science needs to be. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited for the conversation, and, and I'm excited about where we'll go with these centers and specifically with the year of our Earthshot that I know we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, Fabian, thank you again for being here. I want to tell the audience a little bit about um, who we're lucky to have here at the museum this evening. Uh, Fabian has been uh, a really inspiring figure uh, for people uh, around the topic of the oceans since he was a very young boy uh, um, and learning about the oceans uh, from his grandfather. Uh, hold on one second here. Um, uh, he was a... Uh, Explorer at large for National Geographic for his study of sharks. 
Uh, he was part of a multi-hour uh, series for PBS called Ocean Adventures with his father, Jean-Michel Cousteau. And it's extremely cool to have you here, Fabian, because both your grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, and your father, Jean-Michel Cousteau, are recipients of the Museum of Science's most prestigious award, the Washburn Award. I did not remember that until I did some digging and, and found this out that was named for the museum's founding president. So very exciting to have you here. In June 2014, as I mentioned earlier, Fabian and his team of Aquanauts embarked on Mission 31, the longest science expedition to take place at Aquarius, the world's only underwater marine laboratory, which is located off the coast of Key Largo, Florida. And you'll be hearing more about his grand vision for a new network of underwater marine research stations soon. Um, as I mentioned, the museum was lucky to be part of that. Um, we had a really nice connection through my PhD advisor um, to another aquanaut um, at Northeastern University, Brian Helmuth, who I think is in the audience tonight. And uh, this led to this collaboration and this hope that that we would be able to work together. Mm -hmm. And you've been working on this through establishing the Fib Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center to fulfill your dream of creating um, a way to make positive change in the world. You've been quoted building on an idea that came from your grandfather. People protect what they love, they love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. How does that belief drive your work and your connection to the oceans? Well, first of all, I, I'd, I'd like to cheers to that. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your time, the most valuable and precious resource we have, uh, next to water, of course. Um, how does it not drive us? How does that statement not be fundamentally the, the underpinnings of why we exist and what we should be striving for? Uh, and, and by that, I mean that, you know, um, it's very simple quote, you know, people protect what they love, they love what they understand, they understand what, what they're taught. Education is a fundamental uh, uh, building block from which we make decisions, from which we hopefully derive our passions, our, our thought processes, and, and so on and so forth. And hopefully it's a lifelong process. But education isn't, and I'm a prime example of this, I'm not a particularly uh, was not a particularly great student, uh, as you can probably uh, gather from my teachers in the past, and I apologize for that. I love educators. Uh, but in some cases, or in my case anyway, uh, I'm motivated very much by experiential learning, by the tactile feel, by the, the nature of storytelling, by really getting immersed in the, the journey of learning. And that's really how uh, one carries away uh, the understanding of, of the education, uh, which is just as important as, as the facts themselves. Uh, and that's how we can really malleably use that information in ways that are constructive, that, uh, that build solutions, that build a, a, a better, brighter tomorrow. Thanks so much. And, and your answer actually sort of touches on what I was hoping to ask him about next. Unfortunately, we're living in a time when facts and learning are sort of in danger in a way that they've really not been for a long time. And the Museum of Science is a trusted institution at a time when the trust in science is waning uh, among sectors of the public. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see the museum bringing a role in bringing people together to focus on solutions as you were talking about, uh, especially with respect to polarizing topics like climate change. And why do you think this is the right time for the museum to spend an entire year on this topic, our first ever year-long spotlight? Well, it's, it's a reminder, and I'm sure that people have heard this, this saying, this proverb, that when is the best time to plant a tree? Well, it was 20 years ago. <laughs> and well, what's the second best time? Well, it's today. So the best time to have talked about climate change uh, was 20 years ago. But if we didn't really get involved with it, there's never a better time than now. There still is time now for us to mitigate and adapt to the worst of climate change. We know that. We know the clock is ticking, but we know that we can do something about it. And it really requires an institution like the Museum of Science that is really beloved by academia, by government, by industry, and the general public to be a place where people can think out loud and say, what kind of world do we want? 
So this is the time, and a year is just the beginning. Through the Center for the Environment, we will continue to talk about this for decades to come. But to have a year-long focus is a nice platform to get the community wrapped around this issue, pulling the community together, both locally and then online, of course, will reach the world uh, globally, and through schools, we'll reach five or six million people. So now is the right time for the, the great issue of our day. I think the other thing is that I do believe that the tide has turned and that the, this country and the whole world really is really not debating whether humans contribute to climate change. We're just assuming that this year because I think that is generally accepted now. What people want is some hopeful way to see how, to, how can I get a great job in a green economy? What can I do personally? What can we do with policy? So I actually think the tide has turned and it's in, fav in the favor of public opinion to take bold steps forward. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I'm excited about the focus on solutions. It really lets us have a, a, a focus on things that people may not know about, some of these exciting solutions that are coming. The other thing I, I want to underscore in your answer is that for us, a year is an amazing amount of real estate. The things that an institution like the Museum of Science can do with the reach online and the connection to schools and the magic that happens in our exhibit is, is really special to be able to spend an entire year and, and dig our teeth into what you rightly say is the you know most pressing and, and cogent science topic of our time. One little thing I should have said just to pile on to that is through this initiative, just on climate, we'll reach 100 million people just on climate this year online. We'll do a thousand different products this year. We'll have online uh, programming, but also on site, we have a new exhibit which already started, Changing Landscapes. We'll bring in freight farms, which, which will be a wonderful indoor vertical garden. People will come out of this understanding that not only is the Museum of Science devoting itself to this, but there are abundant reasons to be hopeful. So I'm, I'm excited about this year. I'm excited too. Thank you. And I, at this very moment, while we're having this conversation, I'm told that the globe that has spotlighted Mars for the last, you know, six months or something is coming down and they're putting the Earth up. So yeah. while this conversation is happening, um, we're making that transition. And, and I'd love to, to transition over to the oceans now, Fabian, as a specific part of this, this focus that we'll have. As I mentioned, it's been about 10 years now since you broke your grandfather's record by living for 31 days um, uh, under the ocean, studying everything from the behavior of marine animals to the effects of pollutants on coral reefs. I remember one thing they were looking for was like whether they were heavy metals or dispersants left over from the Gulf oil spill. Hydrocarbons, yeah. Yeah. How do you see the world's most pressing issues through the lens of marine science? How can we explore through this kind of work um, these pressing questions? You know, it's, it's always impressed me how much we ignore the ocean. Mm -hmm. If we look at our planet as living space, uh, you know, we, we look at the ocean as a recreational area. We look at the ocean as over there. We look at the, the, the ocean as a blue veneer, sometimes a green veneer. Uh, sometimes dangerous, uh, sometimes for a vacation you walk by it. But we don't realize that the living space that the ocean represents for all organisms, uh, organisms that we know of in the universe right now uh, represents 99% of our living space on this planet. 3.4 billion cubic kilometers of volume. We've explored less than 5% of it. It is the world's barometer. It is also the biggest uh, carbon sink. It is also the one that is uh, responsible for tempering, in quotations, the climate change related issues because the oceans warm slower, although they keep the heat longer. So, you know, the repercussions are, are going to be for much longer because of that. Uh, at the same time, if we didn't have ocean, we wouldn't have life. If we didn't have ocean, we would be basically Mars. Uh, and, and so thanks to uh, the ocean, it tempers a lot of the otherwise extraordinarily extreme uh, weather patterns we would be having, even uh, as they get worse over time. Uh, so the solutions and the discussions and the approaches that we're talking about must include ocean as a fundamental part of the climate change related talks. Now, my family's been talking about climate change since the 1960s. The time for talk is over. The time for action is now. Uh, 
Uh, and being able to engage people, not only with the education, but with the, the proactive and positive momentum that this generation is having in the last few years uh, is one way to proverbially uh, refill the bathtub. Because uh, right now we have the plug out of the bathtub, bathtub's draining, we're basically in a tailspin as far as, as all the environmental disasters around the world, and there's just a trickle coming out of the faucet. We need to replug that drain, and slowly but surely, our actions over time, over the next few decades, hopefully the next century, will have a very positive um, effect on the future, not only of this generation, Quite honestly, we're all cooked at this point. Mm -hmm. But the the the, the future generations, your your children, um, it's fundamentally important because you know, as as human beings, we're selfish creatures. We care about ourselves. It's not about the environment. It's not about conservation, uh, as much as it, as we talk about it. But if we are to be self preservationists as a species, and look at the, the the laws of nature on how to live viably on a planet for a long period of time. Uh, then we must be, by default, environmentalists and conservationists because that's our life support system. And so by shepherding the health of the ocean, by shepherding the health of this little oasis in space, we shepherd uh, a healthy future for us and for our children. Two things that your answer, you know, really resonated with me. One is that a lot of times the oceans are invisible to us, right? They're just a place that we know they're there, but many of us don't live near the oceans and don't have a connection to them and can't see underneath the surface. And on top of it, uh, they are, you know, they are so unexplored, they are so vast that it's hard to get your mind about them. Can you talk a little bit about your work in exploring the oceans through saturation diving? Why was Mission 31 such a special thing? Yeah. And how does your vision for Proteus fit into that? Why, why is this such a unique and, and important ambition? Well, because of the veiled nature of ocean, uh, the, 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 the biggest challenge is always to try and open up that alien world to the vast majority of the planet of human beings who may never get a chance to see what's below the blue veneer. Uh, one of my biggest frustrations as a lifelong scuba diver uh, and ocean explorer uh, is the limit of time at the bottom of the sea. Now we can send ROVs and AUVs down below, uh, just like we do on Mars and maybe Europa one day. Uh, we can send uh, rovers or in this case submersibles down below, but you're segregated from the environment for a limited amount of time. And diving down below only offers, from the surface anyway, only offers a short amount of time. And time is a very precious resource when you are in a rainforest, when you are studying something that you're trying to get answers from, that is a foreign thing that you're trying to find the right approach to, whether it's predator-prey interaction or hydrocarbons or what have you. Um, the, the point is that the luxury of time at the bottom of the sea is the most precious resource. And becoming an aquanaut, which is the akin to an astronaut in space, you become a sat not only a saturation diver, which is a commercial term, but you also push beyond that and live and work underwater for more than 24 hours, right? So, so the idea is to live and work out of what we call a habitat or an underwater structure, which is both a living structure and a working structure. Uh, and that's your home base. Now, there are pros and cons to that, but I feel it's the missing tool in the toolbox of our planet's ocean exploration. Mm -hmm. We have other tools, satellites down to, to AUVs and everything in between. But to be able to have human presence, to have the luxury of uh, basically unlimited, in quotations, bottom time, and marrying the technological advances that we have along with human presence, we're able to leverage that coefficient of time by 30-fold, meaning we're able to do, in the case of Mission 31, which you had mentioned earlier, that 31 days represents over three years worth of scientific research and experimentation as opposed to the same team doing it from a surface vessel. Mm -hmm. So we, we can shorten the length of time. We can catch up on a lot of the uh, uh, lost time that we've had over the decades. And to me, that's a, a, a missed opportunity if we don't add that tool in the toolbox of ocean exploration. Thanks. I, I think you're giving the audience an understanding of what it's like to be able to 
have this extra time. Every, anybody who's ever been diving knows that the clock is on the second you start going underneath the water and, and you only have so much. I can imagine as a researcher, um, you know, y y the ability to think of new questions um, that are afforded by this extra time and the opportunity to have a team of people in a place like you're envisioning is, is special. Can you talk a little bit about what Proteus is, how it will be different from the place that you lived for 31 days or any place below it, um, and, and what most excites you about this vision? Well, underwater habitats, first of all, for the audience, uh, have, have existed in some form uh, since my grandfather's conch shelf uh, habitats in the 1960s, and then, of course, subsequently, sea lab and hydro lab and all sorts of other structures. Uh, but they've always been purpose-built or short-term or short-term deployment, and for specific uh, reasons and and and, and locations. Proteus will build uh, on not only the 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 the, uh, the successes of past pioneers, but also address a lot of the shortcomings by becoming something uh, eight to ten times the internal space of Aquarius, which is the habitat we were based out of for 31 days, uh, we'll be able to uh, deploy over twice the amount of personnel down below, which means you have a much more flexibility. You can break up teams into smaller groups. You can do a lot more work at the same amount of time. And uh, we'll have the ability to deploy them longer with more advanced technologies and basically bring all the tools, uh, all the, the things necessary with one because of that that extra, uh, uh, the extra size and complexity to the platform. The approach is a modular approach so that it can be continually upgraded as technologies get better. And we can look into uh, basically being future proof. Again, I, I say quotations because nothing's ever future proof, but we're able to plan for the future. And instead of being down uh, for a few months or a couple of years, the habitat will be down for mid to long term research, which is, you know, 20 to 30 year lifespan. And so that gives a lot of opportunities, uh, not only to deploy personnel, people, aquanauts, but also to be able to deploy uh, and, and implement uh, different various tools like uh, the seven senses array, which will have uh, data collection capabilities well beyond imagination, as well as AUV deployment and retrieval and maintenance, as well as even uh, have a submarine hangar, which is like a garage, if you will, for a small submersible. So I can see Tim getting excited and just uh, <laughs> spoil my next question to you, and I'll give you a minute to think about it. Uh, I'm wondering what we can think of and the kind of things, how we could showcase this emerging yeah. science. But before we get there, I think we have a video um, that we might be right. able to show that, that gives people a sense of what we're talking about. Right, and, and I, I, did I did forget to mention one thing, David. Uh, as important as the science, the engineering, the technology, the the, the the math, the art, everything that comes into you know STEAM education uh, and and research out of a platform like this, communication, storytelling, uh, connection with uh, human beings around the world is as important because science without the communication of the, the beauty, the fragility, the sexiness, the importance of the research uh, falls falls short of of what the goals should be. So there'll be a state-of-the-art uh, production studio within the walls of Proteus. With that said, uh, I'm a big proponent of a uh, you know, video, uh, video in this case. Picture is a thousand words. So uh, if we could see the video, that'd be great. That's great. Discovery Roger, go for deploy. Let's use some contact with a test one. Before it was reality, the moon landing was just a dream. A wide-eyed idea that hardly anyone thought could come true. Until it did. There was plenty of room for doubt along the way. Where we are strong and where we are not. But when a dream is audacious enough, we choose to go to the moon. Nothing can vanquish it. 50 years later, we're embarking on the next great mission, led by aquanaut Fabian Cousteau. A mission so daunting, it has forced many explorers to stand down. Inspired by their attempts, these brave men and women are picking up the torch, 
Meet the Aquanauts, who dream to live and work deep below the ocean surface. This is our generation's moon landing. This is Proteus, the world's most advanced underwater station to accelerate the most pressing oceanic research. Together, we'll venture deeper into the place where life began and the place that has the potential to save life as we know it. Because the research and knowledge that we will uncover down here will forever change the way generations of humans live up here. Let's make history while saving the future. Let's make history with Proteus. So, Tim, again, I, I saw you getting really excited and just wondering from your perspective as a leader of an institution that is trying to take on science at the pace of change, how can you imagine this helping to further our work in engaging the public around this important and unifying issue? Well, it really does begin with a partnership and to have a partner like Proteus, like Fabian, uh, is where it starts. And then there's the technology. Can we get Proteus into the museum? And the answer is yes, through this production studio you heard about. <clears throat> and then at a much deeper level, which is how do we use that immersive experience, those capabilities that we have to help people actually fall in love with the ocean? To, to As we said at the beginning, you, you cherish uh, and protect what you love, but you don't learn if you haven't learned it, you can't love it because people, you don't know what you've never learned. So if we can immerse people in the ocean, if we can immerse them in Proteus, have this partnership, I think we can actually do a lot of good and that people will say, wow, the world is awesome. And then they will see that science is awesome because it's solving problems and will want to be involved with it. That's how lives get changed. And I think that's why our contributors care so much about the Museum of Science, because they understand that the future rushes into people's lives when they experience something awesome. We see that clearly in our exhibits about space. We see that with dinosaurs. We'd also like to see it with the ocean, deep down into something that people don't really don't understand very well. But perhaps in this partnership, it can give people an exposure to something that they find to be wonderful. Uh, there's, the, there's the ancient saying, the true saying, that wonder leads to wisdom. And this kind of wonder will lead to a kind of wisdom and a kind of excitement that I think can produce change. So I'm very excited about the possibilities for partnering with Proteus. Thanks. And I, the immersion, you know, is, is something that technology and education are, are sorting beginning to enable for us is the idea of letting people be far away even though they're here in the museum through places experiences like our immersive room or the arctic adventure exhibit uh, i'm wondering if you could build a little bit on that great answer in in thinking a little bit about sort of how do we promote that sense of wanting to go off and do something that sense of action and agency after having them learn what are things that the museum is is thinking about and can do to try to get people to move towards not just learning? Well, I think we have to be very practical about that. A lot of it is going to come through partnerships. So these are the kinds of things we can do in our schools, for instance. These are the kind of things we can do in our communities. So that kind of take action, this is the kind of thing we can do through policy, that take action part of of what we are committed to as an institution it needs to be a part of our exhibits, it needs to be a part of our digital outreach, it needs to be a part of our school outreach. Because there's a lot of things you can do in your own personal life, but there's also things you can do through your community to affect policy. At the end of the day, we are gonna to have to affect policy. Uh, we're gonna do it because of an approach toward, uh, uh, toward the evidence as we see it. One of the things I think we can take courage in uh, David, is that good ideas do in time win. 
the, we can, many of us can remember a day when there was no re, uh, public disapproval of smoking. But now there's plenty of evidence and people have followed the good idea that, you know, smoking is bad for you and that's waning out. I can remember a day when people didn't wear seatbelts, but a good idea comes in and, and that gets changed as well. So on the public health side, uh, we have seen things change. And the same thing's gonna be true on climate change. People are gonna say, that's the evidence, that's the right idea, I wanna get involved and behavior will change. Thanks, that actually cues me up really well for, for my next question. So um, both of you are people who think about the past a lot, right? And how it can inform where we are now. You just gave some great examples of public health and how changes in you know the fabric of our society have helped to change the norms and the expectations that we have for um, what we expect out of our world. And we just all went through this transformative experience of the pandemic, which has also informed um, the way that we use evidence and science to inform what we do and how we make policy. I'm wondering if there's anything you, you could mention, Fabian, that you just wished everybody knew. Something that we can point to in terms of data or evidence this is a question that came from one of our, our audience members, um, that it, the museum could communicate if we could do so ably could make the kind of difference that Tim is talking about. You know, hope breed, hope is, 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 bred, is, is fed by passion and, and passion is fed by uh, a sense of urgency uh, and changes in policies and things like that uh, take time, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only by uh, implementing uh, and, and, and supporting platforms like the museum, where it's an immersive experience, where you get people to not only understand, but really enjoy it. I mean, I, I see your, your, uh, your, your visitors here, mm -hmm. and whether they're the young or the young at heart, they're running around from station to station and really loving the things that they are involved in. And they will carry that out of these walls and hopefully well beyond that in time. And that's what fuels that, that uh, perseverance for doing those changes that are necessary or the, the consciousness to make changes that are necessary, whether it's at home or abroad or, or, uh, or, or uh, influencing um, communities or businesses. I mean, CEOs have kids too. And getting our decision makers to make the right decisions so that we can change the course that we've set for ourselves. Uh, to, uh, to your point, uh, as, as an example, there are so many uh, things that, that plague us in our minds and we can be overwhelmed with, with the, the, the crushing amount of information and stress that that brings. Uh, I've got to say that, you know, mo the majority of the problems that we're facing today as a, as a, as a society, as, as global society, as a species, uh, stem from our everyday decisions as individuals. And so instead of looking at the global issues, we should start focusing in on the things that we can do in our everyday lives that don't necessarily cost anything. Uh, they're just uh, a matter of changing our consciousness. Things like, and I'll be very selfish in here talking about uh, ocean topics, but this pertains to anything. We need to change our language. For example, why are we calling the things that we eat from the ocean seafood? It objectifies something that has value, tangible value on many different levels, both environmental and, and, and other and investment in the future. We should call it sea life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, it, it's simple things like this. You know, single-use plastics. We're 5% of the world's population here in the United States consuming over 20% of the world's resources. That's a huge waste. And it's, it's a, a, in many ways, it's a subconscious waste because we call, we, we say we're throwing something away. There is so, no such thing as a way. This is a closed-loop system. It's a little ball in space. Uh, and so instead of thinking, oh, I'll just throw it away, it'll just disappear, Think about what your action is doing. And if we can eliminate something like a single use piece of plastic in our everyday lives, just one, imagine what 7.8 billion or 8 billion people and growing uh, can do in a year. You know, it's, it's amazing what little things, little examples in our everyday lives can make cumulatively if we encourage our families, our community, our governments to make that change. Thanks.
just a reminder to the audience, you can send in questions to uh, MOS Fireside Chat um, if you want to, all one word. Um, and uh, we got one here that I think uh, would be great to hear from you about, Fabian, and, and it has to do with uh, a little bit poking on this idea of like different science and different kinds of outcomes that Proteus and research like that can enable. What are some of the things that you're most excited about <laughs> in terms of being able to learn uh, from doing this kind of research? And are there ways that the Museum of Science could be helpful in telling that story too? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Museum of Science is the, the land-based platform mm. that can connect the, the visitors with that virtual experience, that immersive virtual experience from afar, right? We, you don't all need to go down to Proteus to experience what we're, pro, uh, what we're experiencing, at least not on, um, uh, on, on that kind of level, on a virtual level. So uh, some of the things that uh, came up today, actually earlier in the museum, that were questions is, um, and, and the answers were basically, uh, the things that excite me the most is uh, a lot of the unknowns. Um, you know, before, pro, uh, before Aquarius, before that 31 days, uh, the frustration of, of being a scuba diver is just when things get, start getting interesting, you have to go back to the surface. By being able to go out every day in the same water column, same area, the species, the animals that call it home, at first see you as an alien, a threat, uh, and eventually getting used to you, you start being part of the ecosystem. Uh, and they start acting naturally. So all of a sudden you see behavior you'd never seen before. I mean, I've been diving 50 plus years and a lot of the things that we saw down there, we just never saw before. The spotted eagle rays, for example, swimming around the habitat for the full 31 days being curious. At one point we stopped paying attention to them mm -hmm. and we were doing experiments on the, on the reef and they would come down and dive bomb us and slap us on the back of the helmet, get, presumably becoming jealous that we weren't paying attention. Um, certainly anthropomorphization, but uh, the, the point is that uh, what I'm excited about, I'm excited to push the limit uh, of, of saturation or, or aquanaut diving for much more than a month in, um, in a platform that allows for a community to be tested on, both physiologically and psychologically. What does that do as an extreme environment, uh, as a small enclosed environment, isolated environment? How does that affect that small community underwater? So on the human level, it's really interesting. Uh, and I'm sure that also applies to a lot of things for outer space colonization and so on. On the robotics level, how can we push a lot of our technologies and learn from biomechanics and adapt those things underwater? Right, it's an extreme environment. So you're really throwing your 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 experiment uh, into probably the most extreme circumstances to see if it survives. That's pretty cool. Uh, the the sensors, you know, how can we tweak the sensors to be more accurate, more uh, more adaptive, uh, integrating AI into a, a lot of uh, of the raw data streams, uh, and connecting some of the, the youth who may be watching these live streams from the bottom of the sea and formulating their own experiments in real time right here in the museum, for example, by taking those data streams and creating these new citizen science experiments as we talk and then interacting with the aquanauts at the same time going, wow, I never thought that's really cool. You know, and, and so there, there's a myriad of different possibilities that really excite me beyond, of course, finding a new critter or uh, getting down deeper and, and all those things and finding out about some of the fundamentals of cold water upwellings and uh, being in the mesophotic zone, which is really cool at night, uh, and, and looking at, at some of the, the deep sea creatures that come up. And all those things are, are amazing. Uh, but really being able to connect with people on land and having them be part of the journey, part of the experience, part of the adventure, uh, I think really uh, helps connect science with the average person. Thank you. Tim, I, I'm wondering if you could talk from the perspective of someone leading an educational institution that, as you say, is focusing on new kinds of topics that maybe were not always the, you know, go to for science centers. Um, we're still going to keep teaching Newton's third law to young people. We need more scientists and engineers. But when we get to topics like the vaccine 
or we get to topics like climate change, um, we're going to have to think hard about, especially at scale, engaging hundreds of people, yeah. like you said, reaching people who may not be self-selecting to this kind of science education. One of the folks online is asking, you know, how we can plan with, they say, reasonable opinions acro across the political spectrum and what opportunities are there for us to do a kind of education that, yeah. that is needed for our society? It's a great question. It's a very full one. Uh, once again, I think it's the kind of thing our donors care about because they understand we have to be common ground. We have to be common ground on everything, even on the vaccine. But what, what does that actually mean? And what is the sort of acceptable range of diversity of thought? And so I think it's important for us not to use the phrase, follow the science. I think it's important to use this phrase, follow the evidence, so that we can enable science to grow and to change. And so if we, if we have a, an issue like climate change, for instance, it is important to have diversity of thought, not for diversity of thought's sake, but to have actual questioners who maybe question a climate model or question something that's actually a useful question to ask. And the useful questions to ask always change. But if you get too uh, set in your ways on a particular model or a particular theory, a particular version of science, then you've missed out what science is because science always questions itself. So I think the important thing in terms of diversity of thought is not diversity for diversity's sake. Like we wouldn't have a flat earth person give a, top, a, a, call, a talk at the Museum of Science. We wouldn't do that. But if there were a true question about, oh, I don't know, um, a, a climate model or something about the ocean that was a true question, we would want to have this be the place where we, uh, genuinely engage with scientific debate and discovery. And I'd like us to do that more and more and more. I could imagine as we go forward with the notion of the Boston Science Common or the public science common, we aspire to be the place in the world for public convenings about, about science at the highest level. So I would like to encourage that on everything, including some social science things. So for instance, one of the greatest issues of our day uh, in, a, in a world with 8 billion people is generational poverty. Well, we know the key to get out of generational poverty is going to be a great workforce among them. A great workforce is going to require the great use of science and technology. So we bring even social scientists, even economists into the Muse Museum of Science to debate how do we overcome the problems we face? So I'm very excited about diversity of thinking insofar as it leads to a better result. That was a hopeful answer, I think. Um, and and I, I'm excited about, you know, the opportunity to highlight hope, as you've talked about a few times. What, as an educator, gives you hope when you hear stories like uh, someone who is establishing an underwater habitat that may be modular and global, uh, the idea that there are going to be aquanauts around the world diving, living under the ocean, exploring these questions, and coming up with new questions yeah. for us to explore. What gives you hope about that? Well, Kennedy said it himself in that speech at Rice University. The part that we didn't hear in the clip was that he said, we choose to go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard. <laughs> and that in the, in the doing of this thing, there will be all these other things we're going to learn. So the audacity of the Proteus Project, the hardness of it, will produce all sorts of things that we can't even begin to think that we will learn. I'll give you a, a current example of that, of a, of a project right out of MIT. So Commonwealth Fusion uh, is, is, a, is a nuclear fusion technology that's going to change the world. But even if it doesn't, which I believe it will, already many, many discoveries have been made in the doing of this hard thing. Things like new kinds of drill bits that will be made out of plasma and all sorts of things that will change the world. So in the doing of these hard things, like Kennedy said, we will make many, many, many discoveries that will give us the ability to solve problems like we never had before. It's a great example. And uh 
I know that kind of like Proteus, the countdown is on for them to press the button for Commonwealth Fusion and demonstrate the specific kind of, you know, version of commercial reactor that that will eventually hopefully enable. Uh, and and I'm wondering if you could talk, Fabian, just a little bit about timing. Um, one question we've been getting a lot is like, when will this happen? When <laughs> ha when would this go live? What, what has to happen for it to do that? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, to Tim's point, uh, only the impossible missions succeed. And uh, I've been at, you know, at, at first, uh, you know, I thought, oh, this is a crazy idea building the International Space Station of the Ocean. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we're gonna get a lot of resistance to this, but I really truly believe that, you know, the only way we make progress is pushing the envelope going out of the box, right? Pushing beyond the, the box of the known and the comfort. And um, I was expecting to get a lot of resistance, but instead we got, well, wow, why haven't we done this yet? Uh, so that's very encouraging. And, and, and that's a lot of fuel that we've had through this trajectory of, uh, rather interesting challenges to build something as complex, even though it's based on reality and, and past experience. Uh, what we're implementing are the latest and greatest in technologies, latest and greatest in, in approaches, and also you see certain flexibilities that simply simply weren't afforded before. So, um, you know, and of course the whole COVID issue, like everybody else, uh, was another challenge. But despite that, the trajectory is leading us to a uh, completion of the build uh, end of 2026 uh, and hopefully an installation by Q4 of 2026 uh, in uh, at least in Curacao and a deployment of, of the first mission by Q1 of 2027. That's uh, if we continue on the pace that we're at and, and I'm feeling an acceleration of that pace, uh, we'll be on schedule for uh, that sort of deployment, which is really exciting, a little nerve wracking I got to get my team ready. But, uh, you know, so I, I do want to note one thing. Uh, this is not a structure that we're building f just for us. As a matter of fact, once the first mission is done, the idea is really to invite experts and uh, people who can use this sort of platform to actually become tenants in this platform regardless of where they are. It could be for biochem. It could be for a lot of different kinds of research. It could be for uh, different analogs. But the point of it is, is this needs to be a common or, or communal good, a little bit like the, um, the, the, the United Nations uh, intellectual pool, right? Uh, because without it, without that kind of thought process, we're never gonna get out of the situation we're in, globally speaking. Uh, so to be able to have a, a unifier of sorts um, is vastly important. And I truly believe that in order to make change, you have to lead by example. Thank you. Uh, we're getting towards the end here, Tim. I'm gonna give you the last moment in, okay. in just a moment. Uh, but my last question is, is really about hope. Uh, we've talked a lot about hope mm -hmm. today and, and the importance of it, uh, both in the audacious goals that we set for how we learn about the world, um, and you know, hopefully it's clear to the audience now why we thought Fabian would be such a fantastic speaker for our year of the earth shot, right? The idea of the earth shot um, being the moon shot for our environment, being the chance for us to do it, and, and Proteus an, as an example of that. Unfortunately, the topic of the oceans and the environment is sometimes challenging to be hopeful about. I mean, the it plastic is. pollution and, and the, the scale of the challenge ahead of us uh, what keeps you getting up every morning? Uh, what gives you hope? What makes you want to continue to do this work? <laughs> uh, that's the eternal question. Uh, what recharges my batteries every day is when I look into the eyes of a child. That, re that, that gives me hope. Um, be the hope that you seek, right? It's very easy to be depressed. It's very easy to say, oh, someone else will take care of it. That's not true. It's not going to happen. Be the hope that you seek. Be, you know, be part of the solution. And what we found, even in the ocean, is when one person, one community, one country starts with those proactive movements, we see a positive change in that environment, whether it's creating a marine sanctuary that's off limits that becomes a regenerative area, or whether it's a cleanup, or whether it's changing the, the, the different processes of manufacturing or what have you, uh, or consumption. All those things affect positively 
that circulatory system of life we call emotion. But it's not something that we can just rest back and say, oh, thank God, you know, Cousteau is taking care of it. Oh, thank God, you know, Tim's taking care of it. The Museum of Science is taking care of it. That's not going to happen. It has to be a communal effort. Join the, the proactive movement. And that breeds hope because that breeds positive action and positive results. Uh, how do you fill a bucket? One drop at a time. And that every action, every positive action that each one of us takes, each one of you takes, mm -hmm. is how we're going to get into a much better space that we can give back to our future generations all those beautiful things that we've taken for granted. Fabian, I want to thank you for the time that you spent, not only in this program, but all day here. And, and we spent some time recording in the studio this morning. Uh, and afterwards, you gave a talk on the floor of the museum on what is normally going to be a pretty dead Wednesday afternoon. Uh, but it was amazing to see, you know, something like 100 people in the blue wing to hear your talk. And many children were there. And I saw the hope. I saw and felt the excitement about this audacious undertaking and how we can you know, do big things and take on big problems uh, with hope in our hearts and, and do things that are needed for the next generation for us to live sustainably. Tim, I'm going to give you the last, uh, the last word here, and I'm wondering what makes you hopeful both from everything we've talked about and for our Year of the Earth shot yeah. um, coming out of this, really, what was the first program uh, in, yeah. in this year? Thank you for that. Thank you for coming. Um, actually, there's some really practical things. There are actually many, many, many reasons to be hopeful. So I would really encourage people, if you haven't gotten it, just to get on the Project Drawdown website or to get the book, Project Drawdown. There are many reasons to be hopeful. You might be surprised to know that the cost of kilowatt hour uh, for hour of sustainable uh, energy from wind, from solar, is basically on par with fossil fuels now. People said that wouldn't happen. It's here. Uh, <laughs> Commonwealth Fusion is going to press the button on fusion technology in 2025. We're going to see change. So my point is, actually, there are abundant reasons to be hopeful, but you have to surround yourself with them. Surround yourself with the abundant reasons to be hopeful. Realize that there is a possibility for a true green economy, truly a green economy. Remind yourself that things like cities make sense and public transportation makes sense. So I actually think the challenge is not, are there reasons to be hopeful? There are a million reasons to be hopeful. But you do have to somehow have a community where you surround yourself with that. And that's what the Museum of Science really is. That's what the people who are on this call really are. We're a community of people who believe that among the things it means to be human is to solve problems in innovative ways and that we are a part of that community that does that together. So the reasons to be hopeful are abundant, but it is somehow our natural tendency as our species to give in to fear. The real enemy of hope is fear. And that is something we can't give into in this culture. That's something we can't give into in this election cycle. That is something we can't give into in our world. Uh, and so I think we have to be hopeful, and one of the reasons we will be hopeful is if we surround ourselves with reasons to be hopeful. Thanks, Tim. So, as I said, this is kind of one of the first offerings that we've had in our year of the Earth Shot, and hopefully everyone in the audience knows that there's another one coming up in just a, a week or so. Uh, I was walking with Fabian through our beautiful new Changing Landscapes exhibit, which, if you haven't seen it, uh, highlights potential impacts of climate change on four world UNESCO heritage sites uh, through the lens of four different hazards and focuses on innovative and creative ways that people are working to protect those heritage sites and also the people that live near them um, through creativity and innovation. And I felt hope um, looking at what people are doing and the power of immersing people in an idea uh, and walking through that exhibit today, just as I you know, saw people hopeful in the talk that you gave in the audience, you felt the optimism and the hope and the creativity of the people that were walking through that gallery. I hope I'll see many of you who have been watching in in our opening event on the evening of the 19th. We have some very exciting activities um, lined up for that night. I hope we get a chance to see you um, and uh, I hope you get a chance to learn about many of the activities Tim mentioned and other ones he didn't have time to talk about for an entire year 
uh, on, on this topic of the environment. Um, this is our Earth Shot. We're excited that you'll be part of it. Uh, and I thank you, Fabian, for being uh, part of our first program. Uh, really an honor to have you here. Absolute pleasure. And I, I look forward to many, many more uh, conversations with you and all the best for 2024. Thank you so much.